Well, thank you very much, Sam, and thank you all for coming. Um, before I, I dive into sort of the main, uh, the main grounds that I'll cover, um, I thought it might be useful just to start by offering one caricature. Um, and uh, it, it is, but it's been quite a powerful caricature over the last few decades, which has influenced uh, thinking on many global uh, and uh, national issues. Um, and it's broadly the, the view, the caricature, that, well, we have a pretty straightforward model for describing global environmental problems, such as climate change, which is the one that I focus most on, which it is, which is that it's, it's what an economist would call a global externality. It's something that involves costs uh, that will fall upon people, damage their welfare. Those costs are not factored into economic decision making. Therefore, the solution is to introduce that cost into economic decision making in markets using pricing of one form or another. Now, like many caricatures, it, it has a lot of truth in it, and it's an important one. But I hope by the end of the talk, you'll see why I do say that it's, it's a slightly double-edged, it's a bit of a caricature and a double-edged one in terms of, of policy guidance. Um, and I was really struck by this because I observed after almost 30 years working in this space, just how difficult it has proven to solve a problem that is defined in that way and in which then needs naturally to the debate around, well, how do you share the burden? Who has to pay? Because someone's got to take on this burden of paying for pollution. What's the distribution? It has been called by an extern the greatest market failure in history, but it's also been called um, a perfect moral storm because of all the issues about past and future responsibilities, rich and poor, and so forth and so forth. And one of the most interesting uh, presentations that we've had in the course of the Planetary Health uh, Economic Council that Sam referred to was a game theorist who used all of the best tools of economics to look at the problems of international coordination and um, the very uh, prisoner's dilemma, other things. And pretty much his conclusion was, well, if this is the structure of the problem, it's extremely depressing because both the theory and evidence says you can't solve a global burden sharing problem on this scale. Um, too much incentives for free riding and they can try to do with that. You get retaliation. Da, 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 da. So he said, we're going to find some way, we're going to have to find ways of changing the game in economic speak that maybe the nature of this problem actually isn't really quite like that. And that's what I really want to talk about. So I'm actually going to say very little about planetary health as such. We've had our debates in the council over exactly what does it mean. And certainly something that's called an economic council has to focus upon the human well-being dimension of global environmental change. And I apologize that nearly all my examples will be drawn from my experience in energy and climate change and I'll broadly follow uh, the themes uh, laid out here. Uh, a little bit of, of background about how I see a, a slightly broadened take on, on the economics involved. I do want to say a little bit about the relationship to macroeconomics uh, thinking. Then I will get more zeroed in on innovation pathways and what we have seen and learned in renewable energy. And then I will offer some thoughts uh, broadly about the next industrial revolution and, and where economics needs to go. But I can give you a broad overview of the themes before I get too stuck into my you know, sort of pet, pet themes. Um, and they're fairly straightforward actually, but often missed. Innovation is central to economic development. Um, yes, there's other things, capital accumulation, labor, but a lot of the modern interest is actually in innovation in a broad sense of the word. And you know, we, we have seen the Nobel Prize uh, this week uh, go to someone who did help to introduce technology and innovation into economic theory uh, in, should we say, better ways than had been before, which actually was possibly not a terribly high bar. Um, 
Innovation is in inescapable in responding to planetary health concerns. Um, that is not because the costs of dealing with it with current technology are necessarily just totally unaffordable and not worth it, but basically because the politics, given current technology, appear to be unmanageable. So you have to find smarter ways of giving people things that they want, including cleaner environments. That involves transformation, which is not a simple process. I'll go into to several angles on that. But there's a lot of learning by doing. Um, and that has been known and thought about in economics for uh, over half a century, but not really factored into the mainstream enough. I think there's now overwhelming empirical uh, evidence uh, for the contentions I'll make, and energy and climate change are the prime examples. And yet I think we're still in a situation where a lot of economic models and, are, and recommendations are sort of informed by the rather sort of simple mindset that, that I indicated. And it matters. And I hope by the end I will have told you one or two tales to illustrate how it matters. So, to start with some of the concepts, um, I, I, I get increasingly nervous when I do show this slide because I nowadays think it's just a rather elaborate way of stating the bleeding obvious. But I will nevertheless do so um, because it starts with a pretty simple concept. Um, vertically, here you have a graph that has some representation of resources, resource inputs in the most general sense. In the, I'm particularly interested in energy or the capacity of the atmosphere to absorb emissions, etc. On the horizontal, you've got you could say economic output or consumption or more generally a measure of welfare. Economists tend to equate output consumption with welfare. Obviously that's another whole, whole debate that I'm actually not going to get much, much into. Um, and usually in a textbook you have a nice straight line in the middle. I, I've curved it for reasons I, I, I won't bore you with. Um, but it says, well, technologies basically transform inputs to outputs. And you want to use the best technologies, so you... Ah, we are going to need a power cable here. It is on there. Oh, yes, so it is. I see, it just hadn't been connected, and it's gone green, which should save us from an embarrassing failure, so thank you very much. Um, so, it broadly, the... The general assumption is, well, people are kind of sensible. They're going to want the, me the maximum out that they can for the inputs available using the technologies that exist. Or since it's a little bit ambiguous to say what exists, I thought was the best practice frontier. Where is something being done using technologies that you know gives the most bang for the buck, to be blunt? Now, economics, neoclassical micro theory assumes optimizing behavior. It assumes that everyone in some way is going to be on that frontier. Economics would be incredibly boring, except for the fact that, of course, there's hundreds of thousands or millions of different inputs to the economy and various things that people seek as outputs. And given various assumptions I'll touch on, um, markets are far and away then the best way of helping to make the best use of everything you've got, resources, technologies, etc. Um, and in reality, however, what we define... Oh, so, it's basically, markets are a good way of, you know, we've got hundreds of thousands of those curves existing in the space of different resources and technology, etc. Et then you've got a very, very complex optimization problem and markets basically, providing the prices are right, will help to solve that problem, right, in classical economic theory. So, the next observation is then, yeah, but actually, uh, we're not perfect optimizers. Um, in fact, I have yet to meet one in my career. Um, how many of you woke up this morning and thought, got it, I'm going to optimize my energy use today? Hands, please? I mean, we kind of don't. I mean, there's good reasons why we don't, but it is also amazing the extent to which and the strength of evidence that we don't, particularly in something that is frankly rather boring, rather incidental to our daily lives, where we just kind of roll on with habits and the options we've got and we're used to. Um, all of the evidence is individuals and companies and governments all exist some way to the left of the frontier 
of the best practice. So we're not optimizing, we're falling some way short of it. And that's what these red crosses are, just a sort of conceptual illustration. Okay, fine. So that's an area of real world individual organizational decision making. Economics sort of observed this about half a century ago and scratched its head and called it satisfying behavior because somehow people seem to be satisfied with not optimizing, which was sort of really a bit irritating for the theory, but largely ignored until you had the rise of behavioral economics um, and you know, experimental evidence that made it unambiguous. All of the ways in which people deviate from the theory that we all, like, all you know, focus on getting the best we could maximum out. Um, so that's become more respectable uh, in the context that I use to, to avoid words like satisficing, but also for clarity. I say, well, okay, let, let's just call the sort of the economics or, or whatever discipline you choose is the first domain of human behavior and the second is therefore when we are behaving like optimizing agents and relative prices, etc. Fine, and then we have to think, of course, that curve moves. Uh, I mean, technology changes. This is nothing new, this is not exciting, this is very straightforward. Economists call it productivity gains and so forth. Uh, we learn how to get more bang for the buck. Um, in itself, that's nice, uh, it's not terribly interesting, unless you really care about the pace and direction of the innovation. So where things do get in a, in really interesting is when you start to think, well, where would the economic system just lead us naturally in innovation? Where else might we want to go? How can we drive it? How can we shape how that frontier moves? Because frankly, and I'll, I'll come back to evidence, faced with planetary boundaries or concerns about environmental impacts and, and planetary health, we want that curve unambiguously to move in directions which enable us to improve human welfare, continue moving to the right, but go down in terms of resource use. Um, and um, there's sort of been an assumption that, well, a sort of economic system should produce that. But it's actually, as I'll show, there's no evidence that they would. Um, I'll come on to some of the, the characteristics of that. Let me just say, um, so, so that, that is a very simple conceptual language, right? Three domains, I've, I've given them names, one is a, the, the, the classical names, but the third one is where you look for understanding processes of transformation. Um, innovation, evolution of systems that are increasingly complex in, in many ways. A word about theories. Uh, underpinning these, the middle one is the easy one to any well-trained economist. It's economic optimization based on relative prices. Representative agents assumes that we're all basically the same, sort of optimizing the same ways. Got rational expectations, stable preferences, technology trends. That's the foundations of neoclassical and welfare economics. The first area, satisficing, actually is a very different world. Habits often dominate pretty reverse to risks, changes of new investment, pretty myopic, we don't look very far ahead. Often don't pay much attention to incidental, uh, intangible costs, and other things that are language that economists start to recognize more about uh, contractual failures, principal agent failures, and, and lots of other things. But broadly, you have the theories of behavioral and organizational economics that underpin that. This is not new terrain. Um, the transformation domain, in some ways, and it's, it's quite different again. You're looking at technology, innovation, structure, and behavioral change, typically from innovation in a broad sense, but you've got scale economies, you've got infrastructure, whole development of supply chains and systems, and arguably social awareness as well. And again, well-founded theories, evolutionary and institutional economics, and associated uh, disciplines. Now, the point I try and stress always is, I am just not interested in warfare about which of these is right. I mean, some academic camps can have their fun arguing one's right, da, 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 da. I don't actually think that's really the issue here. I think the issue is, when you look more closely, these are processes that apply at different scales. They apply at different time scales. You look at the actual scales of most of these sort of satisficing type behaviors, and it tends to be people looking pretty short term. 
I mean, even the paybacks on energy efficiency. I see some energy people in the audience will know, you can talk about payback things that will pay back in a year or two, but people still don't do them. Um, in the laboratory, they might ask you, do you want one Mars bar today or two next week? So pretty short term. Markets may be looking a couple of years to a couple of decades ahead, typically in the optimizing domain. It's pretty hard to find examples that look much further. I have was a lecture last week where divided the time scales of financial and investors of various sorts into four categories, of which the longest was the very long-term ones. Guess what very long-term was in that world? It was five years. Um, the climate economists don't start thinking until a decade hence. Sort of. So, time horizon. And then the transformation domain is really looking at process of technological change, innovation, and their global diffusion, typically over periods of several years to, to many decades or a century or more, is how long it typically takes technological systems to spread globally. Similarly, the spatial scale. Uh, generally, you're looking pretty small scale, individuals, local, or you know, units within companies. The classical welfare, you're looking at larger entities, market structures, com larger companies. Evolution and institutional, you're typically looking at the global diffusion processes. So again, different temporal and different social scales. What is the relevant theory, therefore, depends on what's the questions that you're trying to answer, what are the phenomena you're interested in. Well, in planetary health, we are, of course, interested in all of these, and they interact, but we certainly need to include and take very seriously the third domain. Um, what is worth noting is that it is the first that gives you the most immediate potential for improving efficiency, improving services, potentially lowering your bills as well as emissions. But it's the third in which resides the potential for new technology waves and industrial uh, transformations. So, um, if you guys say, well, okay, well, uh, sort of nice little nomenclature and categorization, so what? Well, um, you needn't I've put in some quotes for the next, um, next couple of slides. I, I have an odd habit of putting in quotes that I fundamentally disagree with, um, rather than calling upon authorities to support me. Um, so even the OECD basically said, you know, what we really need for climate change is a carbon price. And governments are kind of messing around doing other things, but they're basically less efficient. And another statement, the EU has targets for energy efficiency and renewables as well as greenhouse gas. Why would you have three targets? It's just one problem. Well, I beg to differ. Where you are dealing with behaviors that are behaving roughly in the sort of market optimizing type way, then sure, prices will really be the highest instrument of highest relevance. Now, that doesn't mean they're irrelevant in the other domains. If you were, for example, to jack up double energy prices tomorrow, a lot of people who had frankly been satisficing, basically ignoring their energy bills, might suddenly sit up and take notice, become aware and do something. On the other hand, they'll probably vote you out of office first. Um, actually, what has really worked far more where you're dealing with those kinds of phenomena are standards or engagement. I, I use simply how buildings have to be efficient, right? That's the rules. Appliances have to be efficient. Or you provide information, you try and engage people. Do you realize how much money you're actually wasting if you're not paying attention to this by not taking that opportunity? And the combination, certainly, of those instruments with pricing will unquestionably help to fashion what you might call smarter choices, individuals and corporates. If you're trying to transform the system, however, you need to get to grips seriously with a third pillar of policy, which is strategic investment, which is basically an investment that is going to yield more public returns than any private actor could make in the current markets. Said like that, we're full of them. You can think of education as an obvious one, infrastructure, etc. But clearly, some of the renewables targets in Europe, and I will show in a minute, were major drivers of innovation precisely because they were strategic investment. OK, so that was a sort of very sort of simple framework to start thinking about this broadened view or collection of economic theories and related that you need to bring to bear. So if you'll give me a, a, just a few minutes on how I see that relating to, to macroeconomics. Uh, oh, sorry, for, first just for the, um, for the sort of those who are sort of interested, well, what, what are the characteristics of these different domains and why do they change things compared to the normal theory? Um, well, first, 
you are dealing in first domain with the behavioural and organisational structures, and to some extent the social perspectives that affect how people behave. The focus is often on social capacity. No inherent optimality. I'm just, the, the, the basic proposition is, well, people actually don't, you know, focus and have the, the knowledge and focus and intent of optimising. Um, and there's loads of, of evidence around the theoretical potential. Energy efficiency, resource efficiencies or inefficiencies. And in fact, broad, broadly in the economics world and develop, particularly development community, there's increasingly sophisticated measures of just how far people are and countries are from the frontier. The second domain, I think most people would be familiar broadly with economic concepts that Broadly, it's worth saying you assume you have a common economy-wide discount rate or time horizons um, that are affected then by risk premium in financial markets, and, and that should take account of things. There's an important features around this, which is, well, you focus on, if you've got a problem like climate change, you just need to impose a carbon price, as I said, to internalise the costs. If you've got another problem, air pollution, you should control that, work out the cost and apply appropriate cost. Basically, they're all separate things. And then you get the equilibrium when you've priced everything properly. In the, the third domain, actually, life gets much more interesting. You think about the very long term. Interesting things about the long term, people are inconsistent in terms of how they think about time. Different actors think very differently about time, their value. Uh, you have interplay between the discount rates of markets and the potential benefits of innovation and breakthroughs, etc. You're looking at systems change. When you change a system, you are not only changing one thing. You are changing lots of things. So if you have multiple problems, like local air pollution and climate change and energy security, your transformation strategy is about meeting all of those objectives together, not just optimising each one individually. You need to think about scenarios you're aiming for. The components may be inseparable, not separable. So it may be really stupid to say to China, yep, OK, for the next decade, you solve your uh, sulphur pollution, build lots of coal plants a long way from citizen-sensitive areas, and the next decade, retire them all because you've got a carbon problem. That's just not common sense. So your decisions, even though they're still, you know, all do here and there, need to be informed, if you're thinking about the mass of it, by the, the total derivative of what are you changing, not the partial bits. So why does all this get interesting in the macroeconomic context? Well, because uh, similarly, half a century or more ago, we had the emergence of, of what became the classical growth model, um, which was a way of understanding how the accumulation of, of capital and labor drove economic growth and, and a clear mathematical equation of how you'd expect that and then like a very good economist should any good economist should went out tried to measure it and said that's funny economic growth seems to be at least twice as fast as this model would predict the residual was innovation or something to do with things that were not in that kind of model uh, in the book, we call it the dark matter of economic growth because it's been pretty thorny trying to understand it. But there has been a lot of progress. And I was struck, just as I was finishing this book, to be in a lecture by Tim Besley, who said, yeah, what we're really finding is that modern theory on economic growth is about reducing re structural resource misallocation and technological advancement, i.e., broadly, first and third domain, are the missing bits of classical economic growth theory. And yet, they remain largely absent in global national modelling and not very well charted in policy, and we still have enduring debates with the Treasury about some of this stuff. Now, I've almost finished the conceptual bit. I'll get on some more chunky bits of data in a second. But just one final point. You've sort of seen this, but it's just to make one point from the policy perspective, which is the more successful you are at driving innovation, moving the frontier, the more important the other bits, not less. Innovation is not a separable thing because you want the markets that structure the support and you do not want people left behind. You want those red crosses to move, not to sit there ever further from the, what is uh, possible. And interesting in the World Bank, one of the things they call the innovation paradox is, well, developing countries tend to be further from the frontier, so they should benefit more from innovation, but actually they often don't. And that's the reason. If they're so far from the present, why do you think they can make good use of, of the future? So, yeah, now we get onto the more chunky 
data, renewables, etc., and where that leaves us, where that takes us. So first, uh, again, some, some quotes. Economists telling us only four or five years ago that solar energy was the most expensive way of reducing emissions and that deploying current technologies was blinkered and incredibly expensive. And on the right hand, we see the chart of what actually has happened to solar energy prices and solar cell costs. Uh, indeed, batteries are on there. Basically, what we were going through was a technological process from research development, technology development, commercialization. This is what I learned in my days at the Carbon Trust. You know, economics has tended to think you've got, you've got invention, innovation, and diffusion. Actually, you've got invention, and you've got diffusion, and you've got huge terrain in between. Um, on solar energy, an unfortunate CEO of RWE uh, said solar power in Germany makes as much sense as growing pineapples in Alaska. Great line. Um, Germany largely ignored him, carried on, uh, and it has been a, an important part of global wind energy growth, which is illustrated in the upper panel, and the explosive growth of solar deployed, uh, with Germany being the primary driver from about 2009 to 20, to, to 12, 13, and, major investor. What happened? A change of the battery costs. PV's costs plummeted. And actually, in several parts of the world, and increasingly, they are the cheapest way of generating electricity. Now, pause for a second. This is the world's biggest renewable energy resource. It's diffuse. It's predominantly stronger in developing countries. It potentially revolutionizes the prospects for clean development globally. That's a revolution by energy standard. Um, why Germany? Well, it wasn't growing solar pineapples in Alaska. It was basically planting a technology in the soil of a country that had the industrial capacity, the financial structures, and the political determination to fund and forge an industrial revolution. What mattered, therefore, was the capacity to drive the innovation. And what matters now is whether, how, et cetera, that gets rolled out, adapted, utilized in other contexts. But it wasn't just solar or batteries, even in uh, wind energy and offshore wind, which even I thought was going to be a really expensive way. I mean, offshore is kind of difficult. We have seen prices plummeting down by almost a factor of three in the last five, six years in the UK context. So suddenly, we've opened up an entire new energy resource, which I would argue is going to be approximately as valuable as North Sea gas uh, in basically zero carbon renewable energy. Uh, and it is a huge resource by, by energy, any standard. Um, where does that lead? Well, as you'll gather, solar can be small and cuddly, and offshore wind is pretty big and industrial. I think what we'll see is the energy system basically becomes hollowed out. It's no longer in a central transmission grid with big stuff attached to it. It's lots of little local stuff that still require the transmission system to help balance all the variations and to tap into the really big resources, which may be concentrated and somewhat distant, like North Sea. On the right-hand side is an illustration from the Dutch and German transmission owner who said, yeah, if we're serious about this, we can construct an artificial island on the Dogger Bank and build out the North Sea wind resource from there. This is a scale of thinking that, frankly, these days we in the West seems to have largely forgotten and sort of rely on the Chinese to think on that scale. But it's, it's very interesting. The chart on the left is one of idea, ideas of distributed service providers. You become an active el electricity consumer, responsive, offering services back to the grid with your own PV. You have local distribution networks. You can peer-to-peer -peer trade with your neighbors down the road, et cetera, et cetera. And you get all kinds of interesting different technologies coming in. What is the key there? It's information technology. Here we start to see the beginnings of why this is not just about pure energy. It's about a lot more. You can buy an electric vehicle. You can plug it in, feedback. So what does this imply? Well, in a sense, nothing new. The quote at the top, I think, is, is well over two, two, two millennia old, since Seneca. Uh, and it basically said, well, in this kind of world, if you don't have a clue where you're trying to go, then um, not many things will look favorable. 
you need a sense of where you're trying to take the energy system. And what this chart tries to capture is a sense that there are brown futures where we can innovate well, um, but involve broadly continued dependence upon fossil fuels, unconventional. So you basically go and dig more and more of the stuff, or you can have green futures. Um, and they tend to be in more integrated, high innovation, low carbon, smart electricity, electrified transport, all the other stuff, more capital intensive, much lower operating costs. Um, once you build them, they run, and it's pretty much for free. Now, I'm going to skip over... Yeah, OK. What I will do... Uh, sorry, I took longer on the earlier parts than I should have. I'm going to go to this one, because this gets to the heart of the complexity of innovation, what it requires. I've shown you the broad innovation train in, chain and outline. That's a technology geek's version, right? Let's face it. And you can draw it more complicated because there's feedbacks. What's actually interesting is yeah, a lot of other things have to change as you go through that innovation process. The organizational structure needs to change. The supply chain needs to develop. You need to get the consumers engaged. You need to develop the standards that make the product safe, acceptable, known, trusted, da, da, da. Um, expand the range of customers, explain, expand the applications. The financing structures change. You start with public finance for R&D. You need to start getting in venture capital. You need to get in this, that, etc. The market regulation needs to change because every technology system is ultimately subject to some form of market governments, regulatory structures, more or less, but particularly in these kind of essential and network services. The institutions around those need to evolve in all kinds of ways, and the infrastructure can be absolutely critical. Electric cars would not get very far if we did not improve the network of charging points. It's just one simple example. So, actually you realize innovation isn't really about technology. Well, it is, but it's about lots and lots of other things that society has to get to grips with and that generally will involve their own momentum and their own connections that forge out and start to connect. Yeah, sort of renewable innovation, that's it. Oh, gotcha, oh, and intermittent, oh, need flexibility. Oh, that battery, yeah, and, and oh, actually transport now. You know, and information technologies and, and, and development structures recognizing that countries have a whole entire new resource. You do not get there generally by either of the two caricatures that I have here, which is either you say, oh, it's technology, that means R&D, let's throw some money at universities and a few demonstration plants, the cost will drop and then everybody will use it. That is the caricatured economist version of innovation. There's another one, which is, ah, it's all about markets, you just force the market, and then once you've built everything up, then the costs drop. Reality is you are constantly iterating between scales. So the challenge then is, how, how do you get down that first bit? Well, this stuff is really quite expensive still. Um, so, when I draw conclusions with Sam's BDI, apologies, the first part took, took, took a little longer than planned. Um, First, this is not a trivial journey. And you have to also think about the political economy. And Sam, I am going to just, uh, just pitch in one mini tale um, about the need to think about all of the, how all those things come together. So about 10 to 15 years ago, a lot of economists said, yeah, it's climate change, yeah, it could be a problem, it could be quite a serious problem. What we really need, because it's difficult for governments to carbon, price carbon properly, what we really need is a big oil shock. Big oil price shock, that will solve the problem. Then, then clean technologies will be economic. Well, boy, we got a good oil shock. You know how oil prices went up for a decade to, to heights unbelieved. What happened? Well, the oil companies got a lot richer. The stuff got a lot more valuable. They became incredibly innovative at finding ways of digging a lot more of the stuff out of the ground and basically learning how to mess up the atmosphere a lot more cheaply than we thought was possible. That's not really the kind of innovation we wanted. It was a reflection of the fact that when you think about the political economy structure, companies will try and move the frontier forward in their own interest, not in the interest of the global public good. If you want to change the direction of that ship, you have to intervene. And if it's a big and heavy super tanker, you may have to intervene really quite heavily and forcefully, which is broadly what, what the Germans did with their energy vendor. So, you know, do we just think this is now going to happen magically, expecto de carbonis? I couldn't resist it when I um, 
across the phrase and the concept. And, and how have we been doing? Well, um, we've certainly made good progress, big cost areas reduction that I've flagged. Uh, we can see the concepts that can lead us into, you might say, a planetary safe environment, uh, individual pockets. Um, there is enormous evidence that wherever we have seriously faced up to environmental problems, solving them has turned out to be much cheaper than people thought when they set out. So we need to seize the opportunities afforded by the revolution in electricity systems, extend the lessons from energy efficiency into much broader materials efficiency, look at the opportunities in the finance sector, which I didn't have time to go into in, in depth, um, focus on investment and returns and energy bills, not prices. Why do I say that? Because one of the bits of data I skipped is actually when you look at countries that have double the energy prices, say Japan, double North America, they spend exactly the same on energy because they're twice as efficient. And that relationship is what we need to communicate. Prices in some areas may need to go up, the bills does not follow, the bills will go up. And that is ultimately the policy key. You move forward all these three agendas simultaneously, you provide the options and the efficiency so that people can cope with and accept politically what economists have always recommended, which is adequate pricing. And that finally what implies you're aligning all these processes in the context of industrial revolution. It's a positive agenda. It's positive in technological economic terms, linking with the challenges of decarbonisation. And it is positive in wider links. Immediately we see the links to cleaner cities and cleaner transport. And linking healthier cities with healthier food. We saw headlines today about that topic and so forth. And the lesson is you do not wait like manna for heaven for the solution to drop on you and make it nice and cheap. Uh, you do not have to just pump shed loads of money into R&D and hope the geeks can come up with carbon removal technologies. It's a journey of a thousand miles that start with a single step. And that is the way that we'll solve these problems. But it takes courage on those first few steps. I'm going to well, pick up there. Thank you very much. Have a seat, uh, Michael. Thank you very much. A, a journey of a thousand miles. An engineer and an entrepreneur. Is this, is this all theory or is this a helpful framework? Okay. So, Michael, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful exposition. Um, I always enjoy the talk rather than the lot of my different deeds. So, thank you for that. Um, it's an interesting move from we had the concept of dark matter and not understanding something all the way to light and the use of solar. And that was a nice little travel and journey that we started on. It always reminds me of this wonderful um, joke about what is the difference between theory and practice. Well, in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they're not. And what we're starting to see was actually in some of the theories we have around, uh, some of the economic theories that we had several decades ago, actually that was really enlightened, that, that theory and practice weren't aligning the question is, how do we overcome that? And the second one is, is really around innovation. And it, it's an interesting question to me. Is, it's one of those, what I call, weasel words. Is that when I say innovation, I've got a concept in your mind, and all of you have got a completely different concept in your mind. And the useful one I have is to say, is when you have to try and reconcile two un, uh, uh, unmatchable requirements, you're trying to do two or more things which seem like they can't actually be resolved, but you still need to meet those requirements. How do you do that? So in other words, our big one is how do we have a, 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 a healthy well-being for the whole planet without destroying the planet? And that's the irreconcilable differences that we have to understand and to work through. And the way out of that is which is exactly what you've been, been pointing to is that we have to change some of the fundamental assumptions that we're working on. And you've been highlighting some of those really good assumptions about it's not, you know, we can't just talk about um, what's it, economicus optim, uh, hamalibus, you know, who, person who's economic optimizer. That's not what we have. And it was nice that you, you pointed out those three variations, and that starts to give us a handle on to say how do we actually transform and move forward, which I think is fantastic. Interesting one is, is to say how that actually plays out is that you took the specific example of solar and, and my kind of uh, view on that is to say in 2008, 
a, a watt of solar panel cost you four dollars, which is in my in my parlance is about three beers worth. Okay, ten years later in 2018, it's 24 cents. Okay, so what other product do we know that's moved from four dollars to 24 cents in that time scale? And so therefore, a lot of the assumptions that we had are no longer valid, and that's exactly what we're saying is that we have to be able to to work through that. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you as a part-time geek is that geekiness is not the solution. We actually have to think of the whole system. And the, the whole system is, again, one of those weasel words, and, and you talk to engineers, whole systems mean generation, distribution, um, and uh, possibly load. Um, but actually, a whole system is not just thinking about the technology. As you say, it's thinking about the business, the market structures, the... Um, the social engagement, the social world, the regulatory environment you're working in, the financial environment that you're working in. It's all of those coming together. You have to be looking across those pieces. And innovation, it requires you to be aligning all of those. And that's a, insert your favorite expletive here, hard problem. And, and you, you're starting to give you know, some really good enlightenment on that. And just to respond a little bit, to give my geekiness a little bit of an uh, uplift, is to say, Technology is part of the solution, but it's not the whole solution. And I would almost go to say it's a necessary, but absolutely not sufficient requirement for us to do the innovation and, to, and for us to move forward. And we have to bring these other pieces into the play. So my kind of two concluding remarks is that it's, for me, it comes up saying it's about the whole system stupid. It's not just about one little piece. And how do we bring that all together? And we're recognizing that different actors have different uh, outcomes that they're expecting. And, and they optimize in different ways or don't optimize in different ways. Um, just as a last little cutting remark, as a very good friend of mine said to me, is once a company's got a return of interest, uh, uh, an ROI of 20%, innovation stops. Yeah? So the question is, why innovate if you're in that space? And this is why you don't optimize around other places, because you don't need to. And my concluding remark is to say, and I think the one for me which is absolutely key in where you finished off is, but is absolutely right, is to say we have to understand where we want to go to. And if we don't understand that, we might be taking that step in the wrong direction. But hopefully with a little bit of elucidation that you and others are doing, and especially around the, the you know, planetary health concept, is we're all going, having some good thinking and doing some co-creation on how do we take the right step to the right direction to get to the right end point before we completely screw this planet over. So thank you very much for your talk. So, well, thank you very much, Malcolm. There seems to be quite a high level of uh, agreement. Um, so you didn't endorse expecto decarbonus. I thought, thought that, that might... Might, might be what would happen. But there might be some who do disagree uh, and uh, not feel comfortable with this, this sort of whole system approach. We've got 10 minutes for a few questions and a bit of discussion, so I'm very keen to open the floor to any of you in the room. There is a roving microphone, and you are on a... This is live stream, so it's helpful if you could say who you are. Um, but I'll gather a few questions. We've got one at the front here, please. Um, and then you've got Chooks here afterwards. So let's, let's take two or three. Um, yeah, Michael, I'm really interested. In, I mean, I, I appreciate the whole systems approach, but I'm wondering about your cutoff line for how much of the system you really want to include. And that there's a bit, you know, going down your list, if you like, that you get to an area that, isn't in there, which is around governance and policy direction and ethics and the kind of moral conversation about what kind of world do we want to live in. And I'm just wondering whether you're able to put that in your framework or whether because you're speaking to policy makers, you feel like you shouldn't talk too directly about what direction they want to go in. That's a good question. Let's just take a couple more chucks. Uh, do you want to say who you are? So Sure. Uh, Chuk Sokarik, Professor uh, of Environment and Development at the University of Reading. So, uh, fascinating talk, uh, Mike, and I'm sure we will carry on uh, conversing over, over drinks. Two short questions. Can you uh, help me understand how this focus on system innovation helps us to get over the problem of burden sharing? 
which you started with, kind of caricature it as something that doesn't work. Um, how is it that focusing on systemic innovation can help us to get away from the problem of distributive equity and justice in, yeah. in terms of solving yeah. this problem? The second question is, what is unique, what is special about uh, climate change and the environment? Because what you've told us today kind of applies in terms of understanding the movement, for example, from a horse carriage pulling to uh, modern vehicles that we use today, or uh, movement away from uh, 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 typewriter type of uh, you know, equipment to now computer. Is there anything different mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your theory uh, in understanding climate change and energy? Michael, why don't you grab that microphone sure. and stand at the front row? Um, so, first of all, three great questions. Um, Chuck, your first one links a bit to Laurie's, a bit, entirely the same. Um, so, if I'll actually pick, pick them up in order. Um, it's a very good question, which and I kind of struggled with, is it something that fits in the side is different? First thing to say is that framework, or at least the way around that I drew it, is, dr is driven by a sort of fairly geeky techno-economic conversation with government about what do governments have to do to solve these problems, right? You could argue, therefore, that while I've, I've offered a world in which you know, technology will change and infrastructure will change, etc., I haven't talked about yet, yeah, but maybe it's a size social values change. It, one of the fascinating, one of the great things about forcing yourself to take time out and read you know, write a book and read stuff is, I stumbled across an article on institutional theories, which actually mapped out three levels that seemed to correlate beautifully well, and then added a fourth. And the fourth were the very long-term processes of social and values changes associated, for example, with the rise and fall of different religions and different practices. And it's said, and that's a kind of fourth level that we really don't have any theories about how things work, uh, or that you know is at least in a you know, a little bit beyond you may say the scope the scope of what I was looking at. It wouldn't surprise me if planetary health does actually lead us to to engage more with that and more with with values. But I mean, I think if anything, changing societal value is even slower than changing complicated technological systems. But doesn't mean it's not worth uh, working on it. Um, what I would say is, maybe one reason for the focus is I was painfully aware from my early days of a quote that said, policies that have done things to things have worked, thing policies that have done things to people haven't worked. In other words, you try and tell people to switch the lights off, do this, do that. End of the day, they didn't really seem to change. So I think it's a deeper level of values that we're engaging in there. Um, Chuck, so you're, you're um, a very profound and crucial question. Why do I say it changes the game? Well, it doesn't remove the need for discussions about, quotes, burden sharing, but I think it changes their nature and implies a different language, which is around effort sharing and, if you like, the sharing of, of investments and returns. You're no longer in a world where you're saying, yeah, this is basically about how much burden the different countries carry full stop ad infinitum in order to keep the planet below, emissions below where they would otherwise be. It's, I mean, I would say the German energy vendor itself, what, which has ger cost German consumers more than 20 billion pounds a year, euros a year, that's a really big global contribution to the effort, which has how had big spill-off spill -off benefits. I think, however, it's also very true it can be a lot harder for developing countries to make use of some of those innovations unless they have assistance with not just kind of selling cheap solar cells, but the infrastructures and the systems and et cetera. Um, where it fundamentally changes things, I think, in the global burden sharing or global solutions area is you could say, and Bill Nordhaus, uh, Nobel Prize winner on, on, on Monday, um, you know, as observed, we, we sort of, we went through an effort to try and get a global solution. Characterised as top-down, not necessarily very true, but broadly the UN-driven, targets-based, legally binding model of Kyoto, which then had to do a straight differentiation between two camps that then fell apart because those camps either became more unacceptable or less directly relevant. 
Um, and then Paris Agreement, to some extent, is the opposite. It's kind of come to the table and offer what you think you can, which is help to get everybody on board, except for a certain US president. Um, but it's not clear it really will solve the problem without something a lot more ambitious. What I think this implies is you can see lots of ways that countries could get together and be more ambitious. The version that Bill Nordhaus has put forward is carbon pricing is central, it is a burden, therefore the countries that are willing to do it have to impose trade barriers to punish those that don't do it. Now, I think that's the wrong framework. I think that is a very dangerous framework, to be blunt. I think the right framework is what kind of cooperations between countries that want to be more ambitious can accelerate the innovation and provide benefits that really make it attractive to be part of this century's energy system rather than stuck trying to protect last century's energy system to, or, or however you want to characterize. So I think it's a more positive agenda of engagement that does include innovation and the financing of innovation and its diffusion as the central parts of the equation. Um, yeah, I think that was your second, does that cover all of your? historical, other historical. So I always thought I had a very big voice. But, uh, <laughs> so um, maybe you can say a bit more about whether you see any clear um, distinction or uniqueness in yeah. the yeah. Sorry. Uh, energy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there are a range of different problems of different characteristics. I think one reason, though, why this kind of framework appears to be particularly relevant around energy, climate, and maybe some other planetary health things. I'm not sure I can think of many other problems which simultaneously involve the individual decision-making of seven billion people on the planet, because just about everybody contributes in some way to the global problem, at one end, and yet is also talking about the transformation of some of the biggest and most complicated industrial economic systems we've ever created. You need to do both. And I think that at both ends, it just takes us outside the realm where the, the, the assumptions and theories of neoclassical reasoning make sense. It's, it's, I draw the analogy with like physics. You know, For two, two centuries, we thought Newtonian mechanics described the universe. When you look really small, you say, it kind of just doesn't work. You need quantum mechanics. You look really big, you need relativity. It depends on the scales of the problem, and this is unusual in spanning just about every scale you can think of simultaneously. We have a question here. I'm going to make sure Malcolm has a question. There's an interesting thing about you finishing on values. We could come back to that, but let's go over here. Michael, I'd like to ask you a question about energy markets, and in particular, how we design markets that drive the whole system to an optimal situation. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you've been involved, involved in energy, electricity market reform. It's done some good things. But I don't think the market, just to give one example, as presently constituted, won't give us the optimal amount of storage. I mean, if you look at the value of electricity storage, the system, it's much, much bigger than any one person can capture because it many bits. So it needs a redesign. And I think this is pretty urgent because if we don't get the right market structure, we're going to move to the wrong solution, the solution which doesn't minimize the cost of the whole system. So do you have anything to say about optimizing markets to minimize the entire system? The global Michael, before storage? you respond, we, do, we need to just capture the last couple of questions. So there's a gentleman in front here. And if there's any other questions, um, go ahead. Hi, I um, really enjoyed both of the talks. I was just wondering to what extent um, you know, these measures are going to be radical enough potentially to try and mitigate usage of, of uh, energy in coming years as well and whether or not trying to get more towards secondary effects and trying to uh, get carbon usage more towards consumers so people can actually understand what you know, this pen, how much CO2 was used in producing this pen rather than relying on the market-based structures that we've tried to, well, not me personally, but have tried to get working for the past 30 or so years. Um, yeah, just your thoughts on that. Any final questions? 
certainly the first, um, well, both would be interested to sort of see Malcolm's reaction about sort of structures in, in emerging economies developing. Um, they're, they're, they're two quite annoying questions because they're both one that I've done a lot of stuff on. I'm sure we don't have the time or, or the desire in the audience to go into great detail. Um, on the first, if there's one thing that I've concluded, it's that market structures need to evolve. There is no perfect market structure that says, oh, this is the design we need. Um, the electricity market we had would basically became maximised competition in short-run electron trading and, per and buying and selling, which actually was probably better than what we had before, but it was completely inadequate for these kind of challenges. The electricity market reform we've had has actually been a huge step forward in the areas of providing better and more financially efficient incentives for renewable investment and in ensuring that the lights don't go out. Well, we've had a decade of headlines about the lights going, going out. They, they haven't because the system's smarter and the regulation was also smarter. What it doesn't do is say, hey, we've got it right now, we can sit on our laurels. No, not at all. As we move forward in both the volume of renewables, it starts to matter a lot more where and how they are, when they will operate, etc. Um, you know, actually it might be a bit not very easy to accommodate a hell of a lot more solar energy in Cornwall at present in the system, for example. So you need to work, care about what, what is it and where more. We don't have those signals and we're not adequately remunerating storage or various sorts of demand side uh, technologies. Those things will become more important and it follows that the market next phase is going to have to tackle those kinds of structures. I don't have a blueprint. Uh, I, I have um, speculated and talked about whether actually the solution is you need multiple markets that interact with each other. Um, and in particular, I think we need distributed markets, uh, markets for distributed energy services. Um, that doesn't mean you throw all of the other markets away, it, but it's something that is fashioned to what you need and what is missing in the current architectures. No, 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 on, yeah. Yeah. So on that point, um, okay, so, so I'd like, to, there, there are two questions I'd like to pick up, but on that distributed markets, uh, that's exactly one of the issues that we've recognised and we are busy creating a local energy system for Oxfordshire where we're actually creating our own local energy market both for flexibility uh, which, which answers the storage piece but also for local energy and then the question is how does that interact with the larger national market but then also with smaller communities that may be more self-sufficient and how do we work with that. So I think it's, it's a multi-scale market issue and I think it's going to be, we're going to have quite a ride actually exploring what the issues and how that's going to play out. So I think that's the, that's the one. The other one that I, I just wanted to pick up, if I may, is very quickly about the burden sharing. I think that question is the wrong question. Um, simply because I think the right question is that we need to move to a place where we have a very good healthy lifestyle without screwing the planet. And the problem is one group of countries are screwing the planet with a decent lifestyle and another group of countries are not screwing the planet but have a really lousy lifestyle. Now to me the, 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 the destination for both is the same. Okay, because we both want a healthy lifestyle with a both without screen, you know, with the low carbon one. Now the question is, how do we get there? And the journeys are going to be different, but the destination is the same. So if you frame it in that type of context, we then say, okay, what's the fastest way for each of us to get to, or, or how do we work as a community getting us to that final place? And my kind of gentle hope, I do a lot of work in Africa, and my gentle hope is that something similar to the mobile phone system, you know, not having to go through the fixed landline problems that we went through, actually not having an embedded infrastructure has a lot of advantages. Um, that you can quickly go into a decentralized marketplace very much quicker than we can in this place because we don't have the embedded interest. Where you can go through a much more low carbon infrastructure very much quicker. My slight gentle worry is that we know that in Africa the influence of the Chinese is large and what they're starting to do is dump their old coal fire power stations in Africa. 
Uh, so the ones that they're decommissioning in China are now popping up all over Africa, and that's a kind of a gentle worry for me. But if we can cooperate together, I think there is a way of going forward where we say, yes, there is a burden of, that there still is that burden of the, of the, 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 the carbon that the industrialized con economies have, have spent. And the question is now, how do we actually move to the new place and, and how do we balance that out? And that, I think, is a better narrative than just saying, we've got you spent, how do, you know, how do we actually deal with that narrative? Good. Can you answer this question in one sentence? I suspect that part of the social and, uh, you might say, economics and markets frameworks involved in here is a move from production to consumption accounting and consumption views and consumption res consumer responsibilities. Yes. Um, we see the beginnings of it, but I won't take time to go into the details. It's a really interesting area, and again, technology helps because it means you can track where has something come from, how was it made, how much pollution was made in, and that changes the game because it always used to be nice idea, but you can't do it, and that is no longer true. Well, Michael, thank you very much. Malcolm, also thank you very much. It was kind of some good meaty stuff that kept us on the vision about planetary health and um, Malcolm is particularly good at bringing us back to where we want to go, the destination. Um, Michael's taken us on a journey. Um, there's a, there's an awful lot in it and there's a large book that substantiates it. But um, they, you know, innovation is at the heart really of the conversation. Innovation of course is at the heart of what the Oxford Martin School uh, does. So this is a conversation that will definitely go on. Thank you all very much for coming. Come back again for a continuation. But Michael and Malcolm, thank you very much. <laughs>